Um, hi everyone and thanks very much for joining. Um, welcome to the UN Global Compact Network Australia's webinar on solving the ESG disclosure puzzle. I'm Sarah Day and I'm the Senior Coordinator for Environment and Climate Change here at the UNGCNA. Before I begin, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which I'm dialing in from today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I also pay my respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today. We'll be sharing a map of traditional lands in the chat shortly. Please feel free to type in the chat function and let us know where you're joining from as well. We're here today to talk about sustainability reporting standards and how these apply to Australian businesses and investors. As the principal sustainability initiative in Australia, we here at the UNGCNA have seen the focus on environmental, social and governance or ESG issues grow exponentially within the private sector over recent years. Frameworks like the GRI standards and the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures have increased in popularity and more and more businesses continue to develop their approaches to ESG disclosure. However, these approaches remain fragmented, largely due to the current absence of a comprehensive global or national standard for corporate reporting on non-financial information. It's estimated that there are over 600 ESG ratings agencies globally, all of which require a, varying, a range of varying metrics and information. Businesses have needed to dedicate significant time, energy and resources into researching, understanding and deciding which frameworks are best for them to disclose against, even before developing these disclosures. Both users and preparers of information are calling for greater consistency and comparability when it comes to reporting on climate and other sustainability related information. The International Sustainability Standards Board aims to develop deliver a comprehensive global baseline of disclosure standards and provide investors with a clearer picture as to how their businesses are managing the ESG issues. Today's speakers will provide us with an overview of the current sustainability reporting landscape, as well as the aims of the ISSB and how we can pre prepare for these developments here in Australia. Joining us on the call today, we have Karen McWilliams, who is the business reform leader at Chartered Accountants ANZ as well as a board director here at the UN Global Compact Network. We also have Zoe Witten, Head of Impact at Pollination, Louise Davidson, uh, CEO at the Australian Council of Superannuation Investors, and Paul Dobson, partner in the climate and sustainability team at Deloitte. A couple of quick housekeeping items before we begin. Um, please do note that this session is being recorded and we'll distribute the link after the call for those who weren't able to attend today. Um, or for those of you who'd like to watch it back again and take some additional notes from what I'm sure will be a fantastic discussion. We'll also provide the chance for audience questions toward the end of the panel discussion. Um, during this part of the call, we encourage you to use the raise hand function, which can be found on the top right hand side of the Zoom call and ask your questions directly of the speakers. Um, but if you prefer to ask your questions in the chat function, we'll also be monitoring this throughout the call. Please do make sure you remain on mute um, also during the call unless asking a question. Finally, you can message myself or our events coordinator, Jesse Lou Lee, directly in the chat or the con use the contact number on the screen if you're experiencing any technical issues. So without further ado, I'll now hand over to Karen McWilliams. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for the uh, UN Global Compact Network Australia for inviting me to, I guess, um, host uh, today's session. Um, so, Jesse, if you could um, jump to the next slide for me, please. Um, so initially today, um, I was just asked to provide, I guess, a bit of an overview of what's been happening in the global space that I guess sets the scene for our panel discussion shortly. Um, so towards the end of uh, 2021, um, but not with any uh, real surprise, I will say, um, the um, International Sustainability Standards Board was, was established. Now that's been set up under the IFRS Foundation, the International Financial Reporting Standards Foundation, um, which are based out of Europe and, and they effectively set um, international accounting standards that are used by about 140 um, plus jurisdictions around the world. So during COP26, they set up this new board. Um, and as I indicated, it was probably, you know, the worst kept secret in the sense that we've all been consulting on it for quite um, probably 18 months or so prior to that around whether or not this should happen. Um, 
the um, ISSB um, is, um, I guess, its, it's, it's formation um, had the support of IOSCO, who are the international securities regulators, um, as well as G7 and G20 bodies. Now, it's going to comprise of around 14 members. Um, I think we've got about 10 who've been announced so far. Um, the chair um, is Emmanuel Faber, um, who was formerly the CEO at Danone. Um, and the vice chair is Sue Lloyd, who's actually um, from this uh, side of the world um, and has actually been the um, vice chair of the International Accounting Standards Board prior to moving over to be the vice chair um, of um, the ISSB. Now, um, the IFRS Foundation, I guess, have quite a significant amount of, I guess, governance um, structures around them. Um, and so this new board will sit under those governance arrangements. And, and as it says there, is intended to develop a comprehensive global baseline of sustainability disclosures um, for the capital markets. Um, now, following its establishment, um, I guess the G7 um, finance ministers and central bank governors also, um, I guess, have been welcoming the ISSB's establishment and also welcoming its progress um, uh, in terms of the development. So it's certainly being something that is um, closely being watched um, at that kind of intergovernmental level. If we could jump to the next slide, please, Jesse. Thanks very much. Um, now, um, how does the this ISSB, where are those standards intending to fit in? Um, so what this um, diagram shows you um, that, that the IFRS Foundation have put out is effectively we've got the grey box, um, which is where we are with the financial reporting. So this is um, predominantly focused on giving inf information to investors around the financial statements, which are fairly well established. Um, the ISSB is going to, uh, standards are going to sit in um, and I'm going to say the red box. I know sometimes on different screens, every time I look at this on different screens, it can be a slightly different colour. But anyway, hopefully it's the next one round. Um, and what we're going to see there with the ISSB standards is that they will have that same audience and investor focus, um, but will build on the, the financial uh, disclosures and will effectively relate to reporting on sustainability matters um, that are connected to, and as it says there, enterprise value over the short, medium and long term. But what we will still have beyond that is that sort of wider sustainability reporting um, that um, is, I guess, intended for audiences um, beyond investors. Now, it's probably something that we will explore in our panel discussion a little bit around, I guess, the interactions between these three um, areas, because I think although it shows there, um, I guess, them being separate, there is that dotted line. And I think um, that's probably been chosen um, fairly intentionally that it's not necessarily a hard and firm line um, between those um, three boxes. Um, but what's important to note is, I guess, what the ISSB is putting out is it's intended to be part of what they're calling um, the broad suite of general purpose financial reporting. Um, and that, that combines the financial reporting and these sustainability related financial disclosures. Um, there are um, a number of concerns around around whether or not the investor focus is too narrow. Um, I think, as, as I said, we'll explore a little bit around that because I think there's a lot of interpretations around that. Um, but I also think this is this is about trying to achieve something um, that are standards that are issued globally that that can be mandated in jurisdictions. Um, and I think it has to start somewhere. Um, and and I guess the regulators are also looking at this very closely to see are these things that we can potentially mandate in our own jurisdictions. Um, and so, you know, how far should that go? If we could jump to the next slide, please, uh, Jesse. Um, so if we look at what is the ISSB proposing in terms of how their standards will be structured, as I've mentioned, they're going to have this in investor um, audience and they're going to focus on enterprise value. Now, they are going to basically take this common thread. And as it says there, those four pillars that we saw um, from the TCFD structure. And that's going to, in, as far as we understand now, is going to flow through all of the ISSB standards. Um, so we're going to have areas around the governance disclosures, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets. Um, and they are going to sort of build on and I guess align to what we saw coming through from the TCFD, which I'm hoping many of you on the call are going to be familiar with. Um, what um, we've seen coming out is this general re requirement standard. So the gray box there and we have seen an exposure draft um, being issued um, earlier this year on, on what that looks like. It's called S1. Um, we get to start at the beginning of these standard um, numbering. Um, and then we're also going to see a series of um, thematic cross-industry um, type standards um, and also 
industry-based standards. Now, what we've seen come out, I guess, across that so far is S2, which is in relation to climate disclosures, which um, probably won't be surprising to hear is, is very closely aligned um, to the TCFD recommendations, um, but is also incorporating some industry-based um, sort of metrics um, which align to the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, the SASB, um, which was originally based out of the US. Now, the SASB has moved up into um, the IFRS Foundation and into the ISSB and, and is supporting um, sort of through that uh, back end. So we've so far we've seen two draft standards come out, S1 and S2. Um, those standards were consulted on for four months earlier this year. Um, that consultation closed at the end of last month um, and the ISSB are now sifting through, um, last I saw in the region of 1300 submissions, it's probably gone over that now, um, and looking at I guess what the themes are coming through in, in those responses. Um, if we could um, jump to the uh, next slide please. Um, so what does this mean I guess in the Australian context and how have we been responding? Now as it indicates there, um, there was a, a response on behalf of around um, 20 uh, peak uh, Australian bodies um, to the ISSB. Um, and, and through that, we look to, I guess, coordinate with both the preparers um, who would be actually preparing these standards, um, professionals, and also the investors are gonna be using it to really provide an Australian um, perspective on our thoughts on the standards. Um, the UN Global Com Compact Network Australia was one of the signatories to that response, um, as well as Chartered Accountants Australia, New Zealand, um, and um, AXI, who were uh, also on this call through Louise Davidson. Um, now, broadly speaking, that response, um, I guess, was supportive of this global approach to setting standards um, that we're seeing coming out of the ISSB, and broadly supportive um, of the ISSB being the responsible um, organisation for um, the actual uh, I guess issuing these standards. Um, there was also, I guess, support for, as I said, this this global approach. But concerns were that we raised in relation to fragmentation. We've seen um, New Zealand um, issue their own climate standards. The US SEC is consulted on climate disclosures over there, and the EU um, is um, also looking at, um, I guess, and, and has been consulting on that. Closed, I think, only last week on uh, their. Uh, corporate responsibility disclosure um, in, in the sustainability space um, and they have double materiality so there's quite concerns around how all of those um, different approaches are going to align because clearly companies across jurisdictions are going to want to see alignment and investors are going to want to see um, alignment and comparability. Um, our response supported um, tackling climate first so as I mentioned we've seen two standards the general one and also the climate one and there's strong support for for making sure climate is the first of that thematic standards that we see but also acknowledging that it's not going to be climate only and I think the ISSB have certainly heard that quite strongly. Um, the, the peak Australian bodies response also noted the need for these standards to be scalable um, and the ability for them to be assured. Um, concerns were raised around how forward-looking statements might be made from an Australian context um, and some of the challenges um, in that um, general requirement standard around its scope and definitions and, and how, um, I guess, sort of suggesting that the ISSB look into that in a bit more detail to make sure that they would be um, easier for organisations to apply. Um, there was some commentary, I guess, around the frequency of reporting. Um, so one of the things the ISSB is proposing is that these uh, sustainability standards are issued at the same time as the financial reporting. And I think whilst everyone was broadly in support of that aim, um, there were some concerns that transitioning that might take some time to actually become achievable. Um, the effective date, whether these standards actually going to be effective, was obviously one of those points of discussion. Um, and there were some comments around, I guess, the industry specific metrics, as I mentioned, in relation to SASB um, and how those will be sort of applied in different jurisdictions um, and whether further work needs to be done on those to ensure that they are, um, I guess, globally relevant. Um, in terms of other things that are happening at the moment, um, the Council of Financial Regulators have a climate working group. So for those of you who are not aware, the Council of Financial Regulators in Australia consists of um, ASIC, APRA, uh, the RBA, as well as Treasury. And they've had a climate working group established for some time. Now, they have also um, put in um, a response to um, the ISSB consultation, and that is actually something that is publicly available um, on their website. And they have similarly expressed support for the ISSB and the investor approach, as well as the climate first approach. Um, 
and I guess they're interested to see um, how this will all sort of pan out. But they've certainly noted that they're supportive of it, of it leveraging the TCFD. Um, and also the ISSB has formed a working group of um, jurisdictional representatives from some of those areas that I mentioned, such as the US and the EU. Um, and certainly the Council of Financial Regulators expressed that they were very supportive of the ISSB taking that very collaborative approach as to how um, those things can be, I guess, brought together. In terms of areas of focus, where the Council of Financial Regulators were drawing um, those comments through, they commented also on the transitional and phasing arrangements um, to ensure that, I guess, we're balancing the need for information with the ability for reporting entities to get up to speed. Um, they also commented on, on around, I guess, the flexibility again in terms of the proportionality or scalability of the standards as they might be applied to smaller entities. Obviously, a lot of focus when we look at these, some of these standards initially is the very big companies, um, but um, these like, we're likely to see these standards spread slightly more broadly. Um, in terms of, um, I guess, other areas they mentioned, and, and also, I guess, the, the industry based disclosures, as I've um, mentioned. So, we've certainly seen quite a lot of alignment between the peak um, Australian body's response um, and also the Council of Financial Regulators' uh, response to the ISSB. Um, in terms of other com commentary that we've seen, well, the, the Australian Accounting Standards Board, the AASB, um, as mentioned there, um, they also put in their response to uh, the ISSB. Um, and they've also released some, some articles online. But broadly speaking, um, they have indicated as, as a board that they intend to use the ISSB as a baseline for the development of sustainability standards in Australia. Um, but they probably made, and, and you'll see if you wanted to have a look at their um, submission, they have made similar um, types of comments to the ones that I've just raised before, um, but certainly in a lot more detail, as you might expect from a standards board um, in relation to um, where they see the ISSB can make some improvements to their standards to ensure that they are, I guess, as useful as they can be, particularly in the Australian environment. Um, now, um, I guess in addition to saying that they will use it as a baseline, um, the AASB is, is, I guess, looking at um, the steps that they can take to ensure that Australia adopts recording requirements that meet the needs of users of both um, financial and other related information. Um, and they're obviously keen, keen to take an, an active role, I guess, in, in this international supporting um, sustainability reporting environment. Now, even though they intend to issue the ISSB standards domestically and use it as a sort of baseline in that space, they won't initially be mandatory. Um, so although the AASB issues accounting standards that have the force of law in relation to um, financial statements, that won't apply in relation to the sustainability standards, um, but certainly not what, what the expectation is. So although these standards will be issued for use within Australia, that doesn't mean that they become uh, mandatory through that process. Um, so I guess taking that on, where, where do we see that heading? ASIC, they have certainly been encouraging voluntary adoption of the TCFD within the Australian um, environment. Um, and it's quite possible um, that we'll see them sort of applying that same encouragement um, in relation to ISSB standards um, when they are issued. Um, and I should have mentioned earlier, we do expect the ISSB, now that consultation has closed, to issue their final standards by the end of this year. Um, so 2022. Um, December 2022, we should see those final standards. Um, but obviously, the effective date when they will actually, um, I guess, have to be used by entities in those jurisdictions that intend to make it mandatory, we don't yet know. Um, but certainly, I think we'll see them um, coming through fairly rapidly after that and see increased adoption. And we'll explore that a little bit in our um, panel discussion. Um, so I guess the final sort of piece of this puzzle of is what does it mean in terms of um, will we see any mandatory requirement within Australia? Um, now, as part of um, the Labour government's, um, I guess, Powering Australia plan um, that they um, published prior to the election in May, they indicated that they intended to, and I'll sort of quote this out, ensure large businesses provide Australians and investors with greater transparency and accountability when it comes to their climate related plans, risks and opportunities. Now, that, I guess, broadly speaking, aligns with requirements around the TCFD and therefore requirements around, I guess, the ISSB standard S2. Um, so in exactly what form this will take, we don't know. Um, but if they are, um, I guess, going to um, fulfill that um, priority that they've indicated, then we are likely to see some movement um, in the next sort of couple of years around actually um, I guess how that can come into fruition, how that can be mandated, and I suspect we will see the use of the ISSB S2 if that's something that the uh, AASB puts out domestically in fulfilling that sort of priority. Um, now, I know that's a very sort of 
vague way of, of saying it because we really don't have that certainty at the moment around what it will look like in the Australian context. Um, but certainly, um, and we'll, we'll explore it a bit in the panel discussion, there's certainly steps that companies can take to start to prepare um, for these changes going forward. Um, so at that point, I guess I'm, I'll stop um, with my overview and I guess we'll jump into a bit of the um, panel conversation. Um, if we could. Um, so I'm joined, as um, so mentioned, with, by Zoe, um, Louise and Paul, um, and we're going to have a bit of a conversation, I guess, around what all these developments mean um, from the Australian context. Um, so if we could perhaps stop sharing the slides, Jesse, and then I can, it's always easy to see the people we're talking with. Um, so um, Paul, I might start with you, if that's okay. Um, and I guess, you know, as I've indicated, there's a lot going on um, in this um, sustainability reporting space um, from a global perspective. But what does this mean um, for Australian companies? Um, you know, it's, it's clearly far from settled. So how are you sort of talking to your clients about helping them prepare for these changes? Yeah, sure, Karen. Hi, Karen. And hi, everybody. I'm um, great to be here. So you're right, there is a lot, lot going on. And um, the way that I'm talking to clients is um, around looking at working with them to see how are they currently looking at these issues and in Australia many organizations are reporting across sustainability information so whether it's through existing sustainability reports using under GRI or other frameworks and the ISSB um, that's been released you know picks up a lot of that information they're already reporting many under TCFD so it's really a build on so it's all about leveraging um, getting across these issues and recognizing that um, sustainability issues are important to investors and other stakeholders and in the long run these issues converge so the better information you have will only put you in, in better stead uh, as as you continue to grow and 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 in, engage with the market but i think for me it's really about leveraging um and building on on current practices and in australia many companies are well positioned uh, for, for, for these changes we go forward thanks very much paul and i guess um building on that zoe i mean um, and I know as we've spoken before, but these developments, I guess, that we're seeing in global reporting are probably just one aspect of a bigger transformation that's sort of happening across business at the moment in this space. So so what is the bigger picture for business here? It's, you know, it's not all just about the reporting aspect, is it? No, I mean, it's an, it's an interesting question and a good point because, um, you know, one of the one of the strange things about TCFD and also about the ISSB um, drafts as they presently stand is that they are disclosure standards but they're also action standards because you don't want to disclose that you've observed a certain risk and then have nothing to go in the other three categories of, of what's your response. And I think that speaks to the point, Karen, that you're making there, which is that we're talking about um, disclosures are a really important part of this and a really important tool. And it is part of a broader set of infrastructure that are designed to try and get the commercial sector to take account for and start to um, have greater governance of what we might historically um, and erroneously call non-financial risks, but what issues that are generally considered to be outside of the jurisdiction or historically considered to be outside of the jurisdiction of the commercial sector. And they're very much sort of coming, coming into the governance space that commercial sector entities are, are now asked to operate in. And that gets called different things in different parts of the world. It was getting called stakeholder capitalism for a while. That term has kind of gone out of use a little bit in the last 18 months, it seems. But we are um, going through a process of basically trying to increase our visibility and increase our ability to govern and responsibility for issues in the commercial space that include a whole bunch of what we would call ESG type issues. And disclosures are a really important plank for that because it allows the whole system to see what's, it allows investors to see what's going on. It allows, it, it also prompts corporates to think and act about what's going on. But it is, it is, um, it's one part of the infrastructure that we're trying to build to get the commercial sector to a point where it can uh, take appropriate account and have appropriate governance for the various um, capitals, resources that have previously sort of been invisible and unspoken, but we increasingly understand we need to have uh, much better management of. Thanks so much, Zoe. And I guess just um, Louise bringing you into the conversation as well. Um, obviously, AXI were one of the organisations, as I mentioned, who participated in the joint um, response to the ISSB. And I know I think you put in your own response as well directly. Um, but I mean, where do you see the benefits of, of global sustainability standards for investors? Why are investors, you know, we're seeing very much a strong focus on, on, on investors as being the key audience here. Um, why do you think that is? Oh, 
I think we can't hear you at the moment, so you might just need to check your sound. No, can't hear you just at the minute. So I know Louise um, just needs to change the sound thing going on there. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, we can. You're quite faint though, so you might need to just speak loudly. Let me, uh, does, it, does that help? Yep, that sounds fine. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I think uh, this is a really exciting development from an investor perspective. For a long time, uh, investors have been, um, I guess, trying to uh, move towards a place where there's a greater standard standardisation on reporting of sustainability issues and not just standardisation but also a greater understanding about the um, materiality of sustainability issues from an um, ESG perspective. The rubber really started hitting the road on uh, with this on climate, you know, and it became very clear that um, that uh, climate um, futures, the, the way uh, companies were grappling with climate was going to be material from a financial perspective. And I think that that really helped to kind of tip the balance in terms of, you know, how companies and investors were thinking about sustainability reporting. But as we all know, for a long time, there has been... Um, too, too, too many options really in terms of um, the, the options for companies to use when they are reporting. And that's been unhelpful, I think, for both companies and investors. And so seeing things coalesce uh, into the ISSB model is really helpful, I think, from our perspective. You know, it, it's going to take a little while for all of this to settle and for us all to become comfortable with uh, what's being um, requested and required. But I think, you know, from our perspective, from the perspective of the big super funds in Australia, this is a really positive development. We're strongly supportive. Thanks very much. Um, and look, we'll we'll try and have a bit of a, I guess, a conversation around some of these key issues now. And then um, there will be the opportunity for questions. So if you do have questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, or near the time you can uh, raise your hand and we'll be able to you'll be able to ask them directly because it's, this has been structured as more of a meeting so we can actually have a bit of a conversation. Um, but I guess the first point I'd, I'd probably like to explore with you all is, was probably the point I hinted a little bit through my slides as well, is this challenge around, um, I guess, specifically in this case, the investor focus and materiality. Um, and, and I guess we're, we're seeing the EU take what they're calling a double materiality approach. Um, some people are saying the ISSB's focus on just investors is too narrow. Um, but I guess it all comes back to the, the definition of materiality that's used and how that is determined. Um, so I'd just be sort of, I, I guess, maybe where should I start? Um, Zoe, I'll start with you. What, what are your thoughts on this, um, um, I can, guess, kind of debate, which, I mean, we, we could have a whole session on it, I know, because there's so many views on this, but if we just sort of get your thoughts initially on, on where you're seeing it, and I guess where, where you see the ISSB approaching and whether, you know, it's the right approach, the wrong approach, and what your thoughts are. I think the point that you made at the outset in your presentation, which was that you, you do need to take steps on this, you've got to get started. Um, it, it is reasonable to think that the ISSB standards might not be the entire answer to the problem of visibility and um, ESG, for lack of a better term, issues management in the fullness of time. But it is also reasonable to take a first step and to build a standard that works for a particular audience. It's a good is a good framing for this. I think as if, if I step back from the question for a moment, and and if you were to say, you know, why should companies be paying attention to double materiality, that is things which are financially material and things which are material to stakeholders, but you don't consider to be presently financially material. The answer would be that you should still, in, in our view, be taking account of the second category of issues, not in the least, because we're not very good sometimes at figuring out what is financially material and what is not. Conditions around us change, and sometimes we can have a very strong view that we understand that something isn't financial material and that can change in a few years time. So to the point that Paul made when he was opening, you 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 do wanna build your capability to understand those issues, to have visibility of those issues and to have management approaches for them, even if you don't presently consider them to be material. An example of that is I remember doing a piece on modern slavery a few years ago, and we looked and looked and looked in listed markets for a case where modern slavery had been material to the share price. And, and, you know, there were cases where there'd been blow ups and people had got fined and all this kind of stuff, but we could not find and back testing an example where one slavery slavery had been relevant to the share price. And so at the time we sort of said, look, this is something you've got to have oversight over. 
we know you need to know about it, but right now we can't tell you that it is, fun, it is material for, for share prices. And then about three or four months later, we had the boohoo situation and suddenly modern slavery was material for share prices because it was the first time that a counterparty, a big retailer, had cut a brand off on the basis of modern slavery claims. So suddenly something which we were sure wasn't financially material had become financially material. And so for that reason, I think it's it's worth companies and on your diagram having all three sections of that diagram covered. But I do think that it is reasonable for an accounting standard to be focused on financial materiality and to start with financial materiality. I don't think it I don't think it obviates our consideration of other parts of that diagram, but I do think it's a reasonable scope boundary. Be interested to hear what the others think. Yeah, do you want me to jump in, Kerry? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think um, I, I agree with what Zoe's saying. I, I suppose from our perspective, we don't ensure that there is this great dichotomy between um, uh, investors as a stakeholder and other stakeholders, because we tend to think that over time, um, the interests of investors and other stakeholders are going to coalesce. And um, I think um, that point was well made by Justice Hayne in the um, Banking Royal Commission a couple of years back, you know, about the, the longer the period of time of investment the, or, or of activity, the greater the um, convergence of outcomes for all stakeholders is likely to be. And I think you can see it in some um, cases that have occurred in recent times, you know, Dukan Gorge, for example, um, which, you know, so massive impact on all stakeholders as well as on investors. And so I think our perspective would be that we can't really expect, as Zoe said, a, an accounting standard, the ISSB, to be um, the be all and end all and to provide everything. But it, uh, the outcomes for investors tend to mirror the outcomes for other stakeholders ultimately. And so we would suggest that the definition that the ISSB has got on materiality is is comfortable for it from an investor perspective. Paul, did you want to jump in as well? Yeah, I, just just to add, I, I agree with both um, Zoe and, and Louise, and I think it's that dotted line that, that those things will move over time. And as ISSB brings in more standards, obviously got climate leveraging TCFD, and that for um, the, the the framework of TCFD with the four um, pillars is really important because it's strategy, risk management, governance, and metrics and targets, and that means the issue is. That that's all about fundamental um, business and running running the business and driving the business. I think that's an important framework to, to look at it. And but as as the ICSB picks up more issues, then um, what might sit in that outer box um, in kind of the GRI land what will, will come in as more financial material. But it's going to be about judgment. And so, to Zoe's point, totally, it's about getting these issues on the radar and then making sure you're clear on your judgments and, and articulating how you've made those judgments of what is uh, more financial material versus material for, for other stakeholders, but being open, open to that evolving over time because it's not a hard line. It's very much a, a dotted line in a continuum um, and, and that will evolve over time. Yeah, thank you very much. And and I guess, you know, as I said, we'll, we'll try and make this a bit of a kind of conversation if we can um, around that. So if, all of you feel free to jump in when you do um, have a response to um, to the questions. Um, I guess, you know, just building on your point there, Paul, and, and we talked about it, it is aligning with the TCFD um, and obviously particularly S2 um, in terms of actually the, the, the content very directly. Um, but um, to all of you, are there, are there lessons or are there experiences from companies in in app in applying TCFD, and I know we've seen it, you know, some so far. Um, probably it's it's been probably a five year piece since the TCFD recommendations came out, and it's been. Um, I think we're starting to see some some good quality reports, but it has taken quite some time to get to that stage. But obviously, are there, are there lessons and experiences that I guess you've seen from that kind of application so far that that um, I guess those on the call can can learn and build on for as they're starting to I guess incorporate potentially S2 um, and, and the sort of ISSB standards and and or the broader standards, um, what would be your sort of lessons or, or thoughts or learns, learnings? Yeah, I think the key lesson is to um, talk about these issues as, you know, as recent opportunities as part of the business strategy overall and bringing that in and evolving that thinking and the power of the qualitative discussion, teasing out what might happen if the, under this scenario or under that scenario and qualitative is really powerful and that engages executives boards to, to think through what could be the impacts. And then you can tease those out in a more quantitative way, but qualitative is really powerful. And as this evolves over P 
picking up more issues, um, seeing that the linkage between climate or biodiversity, natural capital into the business impacts both positive and negative are really important. And so um, in my experience working with clients, it's that qualitative discussion, understanding, and the businesses are already considering or, or feeling impacts of these issues already, and it's teasing those out talking about them, sharing them, and then unpacking is, is the power because it comes down to strategy. And then the organization can make choices about how do they mitigate? How do they manage them? How do they look at opportunities? Um, so that's the power of it. It's, it's not disclosure for the sake of disclosure. It's actually, what does the organization can do to manage risk that also uh, lean into opportunities um, in many of these areas. And I think that's really the power I've seen through TCFD adoption and that will hopefully, you know, evolve through ISSB as, as it continues to, to drive standardization um, and, and, and elevate the, um, the aspects of the, these issues across the market. Yeah, I think, um, can, I, can I just jump in on, pick up a really interesting, I think that's a really interesting point, Paul, just the, the, this shouldn't be seen in a vacuum that is separate from um, mm -hmm. business strategy and the focus of a business. And it was um, quite surprising to me, KPMG, I think it was, just recently did a study of um, the um, ASX 300 and found that around about 25% of companies in that group thought that they had no exposure to ESG risk. And, um, you know, that, that really um, was hard to believe that there would be, you know, companies that have zero exposure to any ESG risk from, a, you know, in a material sense. And I think that really um, is a bit of a wake up call for companies to sort of, you know, you may not have a massive exposure to climate, but you're going to have a massive exposure to something, whether it's, I don't know, employee safety or, um, you know, stakeholder relations with your local community or whatever it might be. Um, I think there's, it's really important for this to be strategic thinking about um, what is reported and what is considered to be, um, you know, a, a sustainability issue. I would build on those and say that um, one of the things that has been really powerful about the TCFD and um, Karen, to your earlier presentation, you can see it, um, you see that it's been picked up, is um, that we've got, we've got a series of um, categories of responses that have kind of been identified as a relevant framework for responses not just on climate change but on a broader set of issues so that you know the four four circles um governance strategy um risk management metrics and targets uh it's been that i think you know we were talking about tcfd we do talk about tcfd as a uh, disclosure framework, but to the points that everyone's made, it's a strategy framework, it's a response framework, and it does outline a, the set of infrastructure that you might like to have around an issue, not just climate change, but any issue. So it's useful, it's good to see that picked up by the ISSB, and they've said this framework of response is a good framework for issues beyond climate change. One of the things I would reflect on that we've learned from TCFD, I think, that is relevant for ISSB and will be relevant for TNFD and for other disclosure standards, is that when it was initially launched, and um, Louise and I had many of these conversations, I'm sure Paul had them as well, I know Karen had them, there were great ambitions for what TCFD would do in the market and what the, you know, I remember talking to people who were sort of saying, we'll get scenario analysis results, financial results from all the companies that we own, and then we'll be able to filter it up and have a map of who's impacted by which scenario across a portfolio, because I always work with investors. And that those a lot of those expectations haven't been met and that's not surprising in some senses because tcfd doesn't solve all the analytical problems that you're having to deal with it doesn't magically make it easier to assess physical climate change risk as an example it doesn't make it easier for you to equate risks across really different industries and find some sort of central rosetta stone that's going to tell you how to think about those in one fell swoop so we had some very high expectations of TCFD and a number of those expectations weren't met. And I would say that will probably be the case for ISSB as well, particularly just reflecting on the commentary that has, has, has emerged around it. You know, I think in the first half of this year, following the announcement of the exercise before the exposure drafts landed, I probably, the number of conversations I was in where someone would go, oh, ESG data is bad, ISSB will fix that, great. You know, and so there's sort of the expectation that ISSB will be this silver bullet that just makes the whole thing easy. And so that's 
and it's certainly not what's happened with TCFD. So that would be one of my learnings from TCFD for the ISSB process and probably also for the other thematics and, and TNFD as well. But I think, Zoe, um, I totally agree, but I also think the positive aspect is it's actually got it on the agenda for discussion at board when prior to it, it was much niche. So it's evolved, but it's not perfect. And I think we also should, you know, should recognise that financial reporting has been around for 100 years and it's not perfect now. And we're trying to do a lot in this space in a really short time. So that so but, but the maturity's moved, moved a lot. And I think you know, ICSB will help with that. But there is those issues around guidance and, 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 and detail that, that need to be worked through totally. I also think um, that, you know, it just, it has been a blocker for a lot of organisations that there were so many different standards and people mm. didn't really know which way they should go, where how to, where to start and so on. So I, I think having one clear kind of central point about at, at, to, to which companies, all organisations can go is going to be, um, you know, helpful in removing that blockage. No, thanks very much. And I can see Prue's also put something in the comments around the purpose of ISSB is to provide that global baseline for sustainability reporting rather than, than the silver bullet. And I think that's exactly right. But I, yeah, And I think as the panellists have indicated, though, there may be some sort of external expectations that it may manage to do a lot more than that. Um, but I think, yeah, as always indicated, we've, we've got to start somewhere and we've got to be practical on what can be um, achieved. But do, do keep the questions coming. We'll come to them in, in a moment. Um, but I guess thinking around the, the audience here, and, and I guess always as you indicated, you know, the ISSB as a global baseline um, and their standards will be very helpful particularly for those companies particularly the the 25 percent who don't have any esg um, or, or don't think they don't have any esg material risks um, according to that research but um, obviously um, we're talking to an audience here of um, un global compact network australia members um, who, who are engaged with sustainability um, and so a number of these may well be um, already reporting in line with some of the existing sustainability um, sort of uh, frameworks um, and you know the GRI is one of those that, that's quite heavily used within Australia. Um, now I know in March that the ISSB has, has established an, a memorandum of understanding with the GRI to look at how they can co coordinate their work programs and standard setting and obviously the GRI was that sort of external box on, on my slides that I showed earlier. Um, but I guess talking sort of to, to the panel today, what, what are your sort of thoughts for companies who are currently reporting in line with some of the existing sustainability um, frameworks out there? What what should they do in terms of preparing for, for ISSB? Is there, is there changes they need to make or is it sort of keep doing what you're doing? Um, any thoughts on that? I'm looking at Paul. Paul, go first. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I think the first thing is is doing a gap assessment against, you know, what are you currently reporting on? versus what the ISSB in its current form is asking, and there will be some good overlap. Um, the S1 is around material sustainability issues, so a lot broader, and much of that will be already to an extent in some GRI reporting. Um, S2 is really TCFD, I mean, GRI and TCFD are not super aligned, except necessarily around your emissions reporting, so there is some good coverage there. So as I said, I think my first comment was, it's about leveraging. So what, 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 how do you currently approach ESG issues, sustainability issues, um, and comparing that to, to what is likely to come down the line from ISSB? Um, but then think, I think more broadly though, um, you know, this is only going one way, which means more disclosure around this consistently. So there's a point around the systems and processes you need to get this information um, to the folks that need it and think about strategically. Um, currently, many sustainability reports in well, we'll support many clients in this space it's often done once a year through spreadsheets and that'll need to change because um, it'll need to be reported more in a standardized fashion but also there's opportunity to get that information timely throughout the year so that decisions can be informed by it so that's the opportunity so use this as an opportunity um, to embed um, ESG issues and sustainability issues into the business more broadly which is back to that strategy comment that that we just touched on I would add to that that the you know, ISSB compared to some of the other standards that are sitting out there, what the ISSB exercise should do is put depth and rigour into the, the sort of issues which will already be identified at the high end of the materiality spectrum and almost round out the response to those. And so to Paul's point, the gap analysis is, is really useful, but you, you're, it's not that ISSB is going to obviate other standards because you're still going to want to do that that tranche of reporting that is about a broader set of issues that are not demonstrated necessarily or not considered to be financially material at this point, but that you still want coverage on and that you still have stakeholders who want disclosure on. So it's also, I think, important not to think that we're sort of going to do ISSB and then the other standards are just kind of going to go 
into into that exercise. ISSB provides a lot of depth to certain issues and you'll probably need to build out the response that you might have and deepen it in certain places, but it's not going to take GRI and sort of make it an irrelevant disclosure standard. Yeah, the, I think the only thing I'd add would be um, that, um, you know, uh, the, the fact that the ISSB is under development and I guess there's going to be a little bit of a lag between now and when reporting against the ISSB um, is required to start, I, I think that gives organisations an opportunity really to prepare themselves, you know, along the lines of what Paul in particular was saying. Um, we, we, our view would be that um, companies ought to, um, if they haven't already, ought to adopt the TCFD and um, make sure that reporting against TCFD continues whilst we, um, whilst we move towards the ISSB adoption as well. Thanks, Louise. And you probably could give me a nice sort of segue, I guess, into the final question. I was going to sort of perhaps ask the panel and then we'll jump to, I can see we've got quite a lot of questions now coming through the chat. Um, but the question um, I was just going to sort of pose is, I guess, and I hinted at it a little bit in relation to my slides, but what are your thoughts on what this means in Australian context and, and, and I guess, government, um, you know, regulation, you know, how do you see these standards fitting in? What, what do you want to see, um, I suppose, more to the point, happening in relation to Australia? Um, do we want to see mandatory um, climate disclosures? Do we want to see mandatory non-financial? Um, sorry to use that term, Zoe, but, you know, we know what we're talking about, sustainability reporting. You know, what what, what are we sort of, what's, what's the vision for the future that, that um, you as panellists perhaps have and would like to see um, happening? Um, and I guess, what, what do we think is the realistic approach as well? Um, Zoe, did you want to go first? I think Louise has come off mute. I don't know if you wanted to go first. Sorry, oh. I spotted that at the last minute. Sorry. No, no that's fine. I've, oh, no, hurry. I, I was, all I was going to say is um, we really um, have, are keen for to avoid fragmentation, like to avoid, you know, Australia having a set of standards and someone, every, every country having their own set of standards because I think that's not helpful for um, companies or investors. So um, uh, we... Uh, it sounds as though, as you said in your introduction, Karen, that there is an appetite at government level for some um, mandation of some of the um, standards, particularly I expect TCFD and probably the ISSB more broadly. Um, you know, I guess at the moment there's already um, for listed companies, particularly some pretty strong indications in the ASX corporate governance principles, you know, on an if not, why not basis about what ought to be reported and um, uh, and the way that companies ought to be thinking about these things. But I think that it won't, I would expect we will move to a, a, a mandatory, a, a, at least a, a baseline of standards that will be mandatory. And I think that'll be, that'll be helpful so long as they're globally consistent. I would, I guess, add to that, that I think there are, when we think about this at a really high level, there are two tasks that we're trying to achieve with um, reporting in Australia. And one of those is to um, get us to a point where we have sufficient information in all of our um, various, uh, all of our various domains to make the right decisions, to manage risk in the right way, to allocate capital the right way. You can see I've got my shareholder hat on here, but that's, that's one of our big goals. And I'd say that the other big goal is for us to get our commercial engine world to a point where it is uh, capable of governing these issues and, and uh, in an appropriate way and creating models that we can select, which are more net positive than they otherwise might be. That second goal is a long, long goal. And it's a, it's, it's a long play and it's not a play that's unique to Australia. Um, but I, but in the, in, in the interest of getting us to those points, to Louise's point, I think um, mandatory disclosure is useful um, in, in line with this standard. And also I'm sure that there'll be additions to this standard and, and standards, more standards to come because it gets us across that uncertainty point. For both of those goals, we're going to have to, and I think there's a really nice, there's a paragraph somewhere, I think it's in um, exposure draft one that sort of says, um, you may have to estimate some data and that is okay because we often have to estimate sustainability based data and and get used to it basically um i think uh making these standards mandatory helps us get through that because paul i think you made the point earlier that we've been doing financial reporting for you know more than 100 years now and it is essentially 
made up, but made up in a sense of in a, in a set in a set of frameworks and norms and with a certain level of rigor that allows us to have confidence in it. We've got to get to that point with sustainability related data. So making disclosure mandatory helps us actually get through that uncertainty. Um, and so I think that's a really important first step for us here. And obviously, I think as it has, has been indicated by another a number of bodies doing climate change first is probably useful because we know it very well. Um, but as, as far as it gets to that broader goal of, of giving us um, insight and governance into sustainability issues across our commercial sector, I think these standards will, will be really, really helpful in doing that. But there's quite a bit more work um, to be had on that front. And, and I think that gets us into the world of sort of taxonomies. And I think there are a few questions about the European approach as well in the mix. Um, so a bit more work to do before we get to that second goal. Paul? Um, I agree with both Louise and Zoe. And so yeah, echo man mandation around the key issues, um, particularly climate and no Australian specific additional disclosures because we don't want to overburden Australian companies. We are a small market globally, which so we need to align with what's happening in the major markets. Um, but also, you know, continue to, to drive that this is not disclosure for the sake of disclosure, it's actually really dealing with fundamental issues that go to the heart of successive organisations going forward. So um, that, that framing in particular. Thanks. So I think that's pretty overwhelming from the panel that we're, we're all um, definitely supportive of, of man mandatory standards in due course and, and probably the climate first approach. Um, now, Pooh, I know you had your hand up earlier. Did you want to sort of pose a question or comment? Yeah, it's, it's, it's just a comment. I was um, talking with a, a client of ours, um, a, a large company with, with lots of ENS uh, exposures who had done that mapping that Paul was referring to between SASB and they were, their, their external, this was a couple of years ago, their reporting was very GRI focused. It was a lot easier than they had anticipated um, there was a big crossover in the data from SASB and, and GRI. So you know, I don't think companies should be really scared if they've had gone down the GRI pathway to then you know, start that, that SASB process. Um, that the, the whole team was very surprised that it, it was a lot less complicated than they had anticipated. Oh, thanks very much, and I think that's that's useful for those who are who are sort of perhaps looking at it from that perspective. Um, now, um, I've just got some of the questions, I guess, that have been put into the chat coming through, um, and and there are a lot of them. So I'm, um, uh, Sarah's helping filter them through to me um, directly. Um, but I guess one of the questions here is around what you know the the panelists. What's your um, thoughts on the degree to which the evolving standards um, will support organisations contribute to a healthy society and environment? Um, or are they more focused on supporting the organisations to protect their own financial performance? Um, Zoe? The disclosure standards, um, and you know, as we've been talking about, it's not just disclosure, disclosure is sort of the end point, so it was sort of the end point, but it's one part of the, the pathway that involves strategy, you know, changes in the behaviour of the company. Um, because of that feature, the standards I, I expect will do a lot to um, force companies to continue to manage and have uh, insight into an oversight of issues that previously just wouldn't get addressed and therefore would just kind of um, sit, sit in the system. But it's not, you know, to the, to the earlier conversation, and I like Louise's point about timelines, you know, if you go on a long enough timeline, most of these things become material, financially material because they eventually come out in the wash. But we do nonetheless end up find ourselves in situations where you can sit with an issue for a very long time and without it becoming material. And back to the modern slavery example, it was one of those for about 20 years. You know, we knew it was sitting in a number of Australian firms or that a number of Australian firms had exposure to it, but it just really wasn't really hitting the bottom line. The people who were affected had so little power that it was very, very difficult for it to become financially material. And it wasn't before it became a revenue risk or a reputational risk for really big actors like um, supply chain intermediaries that it started to actually hit the bottom line. So that's to say that I think these standards will go a long way to getting and, and prompting companies to take account of issues and put, put management around issues. But there are still going to be issues that either the set of entities that are reporting into these standards aren't touched by or don't touch as much, or where the counterparties aren't in an appropriate position, the counterparties to that risk aren't in an appropriate position to make it material. And so even though you've got this really excellent 
um, reporting framework, that, that that issue just um, doesn't get traction in it or doesn't get affected by it in the same way. That's a long way of saying I think it'll fix some of the problems, but not all of them. Yeah, I agree. It's it's. Um, I think Prue said in the in the in the chat, it's not a silver bullet. It's not going to fix everything, and we ought not to expect that it will. But I do think that you know the evolution and 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 now mainstreaming of ESG considerations. You know, if you think about where that sits now compared to five or ten years ago, um, they, these were conversations that were rarely had between investors and companies 10 years ago. And so the very existence of those conversations, let alone uh, reporting standards around these issues, is changing, I think, the way companies think about these things and manage these issues. And um, and so, I, you know, ultimately, um, aside from, uh, you know, with my investor hat on saying, well, you know, that's a good thing from an investor perspective. Ultimately, from the perspective of humanity, that's also a good thing. Um, but yeah, I think I think we can't expect that it's going to fix everything. Thanks. Um, so I guess another question we've got coming through, um, do any panellists have a view on the relevance of the OECD guidelines and NCP complaints role um, for ESG disclosure? Um, so any, I can see Zoe going, no, not really. Um, um, sounds like that one might be a bit out there. Paul? Uh, nothing specific other than, I think it's just another example of there's still a lot of frameworks out there and we need to converge because we're diverged. So we need to keep converging and trying to look through to what's the issue that those standards are trying to address. And in the chat, there's comments about the FRAG in the EU and the SEC in the US. So they're all trying to deal with these same issues. So how do you how do you look through and, and leverage? But I think it's still there's ways to go around around converging um, and, and hopefully ICB helps with that, but it's not going to be perfect. No worries, thanks. Um, so looking through the, the next questions, um, this, the question is saying it was mentioned that um, financial accounting standards, if there is a law, um, in, but in Australia, the sustainability standards will not be issued um, to be mandatory um, by law, by the AASB. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Um, now, I'm guessing that's partly probably links to that question that we've actually just have, I guess, which which was around should they be mandatory or not? And I think everyone was fairly, um, the panel were pretty clear actually that they should be mandatory. Um, but at the moment, because um, they, they will be issued, um, I guess, outside of the, the legally binding set of standards, they won't just because the WSB issues them doesn't mean that they will have that force of law. But I think, and Louise, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what we will see though is, is investors asking for this disclosure. So there, there will be that sort of form of um, sort of demand coming through as well, that even if they are there in a voluntary capacity, investors are gonna be saying, but why aren't you doing this? Yeah, I think that's certainly the case, Karen. Um, and, and I mean, you've seen that um, with respect to the TCFD, you know, which are not mandated, but there is, um, you know, very high now adoption in um, particularly listed companies. I mean, I guess that's the other consideration here. You know, we're, we're really sort of focused here on listed companies, and obviously that's my interest. But um, all of this stuff has a much broader application as well, I, I would hope, certainly. Yeah, thank you. And I guess I've got a question coming in, actually, which was specifically on that, which is looking at, well, you know, the the... I guess the reporting entities are also going to be looking through their supply chain um, and we've got SMEs who are part of that supply chain but don't necessarily have their own reporting requirements. So what would we see larger companies needing to do to support and I guess capture, support those SMEs I guess but also sort of capture data on supply chain performance? Where do we see some of that um, work taking place? Um, yeah, we're already seeing that now with, with um, large organizations, you know, engaging with their suppliers around certain information sets, particularly in emissions and supply chain and human rights data. So that will that will continue. Um, but I also think there's opportunity for, um, you know, medium businesses to look at what their major partners are doing and try and align. And I've got a lot of examples of, of clients who are in the value chains of majors and recognizing we need to make sure we are addressing some of these issues so that we continue to have them as key customers and so on. So I think there's, you know, opportunity there um, to continue to support, but recognizing that there is, it, 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 there's these whole issues that are very much value chain oriented. Um, and so it's important to understand where you sit in the value chain and how you can engage with, with partners up and down um, because the questions will come and it's better to 
I guess, be on the front foot, in my view, versus wait to be asked and be chasing. I would add to that, Karen, that we're seeing some really um, innovative approaches and, 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 you know, really impressive approaches to companies managing these risks in their supply chain. And to Paul's point there, they tend to be very collaborative. So a lot of the time you're coming to the supply chain saying, I need this data and it's the first time that the counterparty has had to think about that, depending on where your supply chain sits and, you know, what country it's in and what sector it's in and the size of the entities in the supply chain. Um, and I think in response to that and the need for capability development and support in, in some of those supply chains, we're seeing some really creative and um, quite heartening approaches actually to building capability and building risk um, awareness and building resilience in supply chains that probably five or six years ago, um, I can remember seeing one or two companies with those types of approaches and people were like, outrageous, why would they do that? You know, why are they spending so much time with their suppliers or why are they investing outside the boundary of their own company or why do they even care about this stuff? Um, now those responses are starting to look a lot more regular. So that's, a, I think, a really, um, I mean, it's a really nice feature of the conversation about company transition for climate change. But I think it's a, a, an interesting and useful feature of this more broadly is that it is forcing us to, I guess, move away from the world in which the supply chain was taken for granted and was just in time and was as lean as humanly possible and towards a, a world where that's all a bit more resilient and therefore um, a little less exploitative as well. I think the, uh, the great toilet paper shortages of um, the pandemic taught us all a bit about supply chain, Zoe. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, thanks. Thanks all. Um, now, just um, for everyone, you know, remember you can put your questions in the chat, or if you want to put your know, use the hand um, raise hand function, um, and then I can come to you um, with questions as well. Um, now, one um, that's come through, I think, that is is obviously quite interesting, is around. Um, I guess the standards are different from traditional financial disclosures. Um, they're going to increase focus on internal processes, uh, qualitative um, and forward-looking information. How are we going to get the same level of rigor around the sustainability-related financial information as we as, as is already required, I guess, for financial reporting? Um, and I think, um, and I can't remember who, who you mentioned, but I th actually it was Zoe, I think it was you talking about the fact that it does, the standards do acknowledge that fact that things are not going to be perfect and it's going to be estimations. But obviously there is that sort of sense we want to try and get a good level of rigor over the, the disclosures so they can be relied on for decision making purposes. Paul you came off mute I feel you might have a comment there and I can follow you. Sure you yeah, know I, I think it's about um, you know investing into the systems and processes and data understanding what's there um, and these are broader disclosures because the financial reporting doesn't ask you to talk about your risk management, your strategy, your governance, and your metrics and targets. It's largely on, on the numbers. So it's about um, focusing on the information flows, um, you know, potentially investments in more folks around and in capability uplift um, so that you get that rigor in systems. And then there's the, the um, focus on the timeliness of information. So moving from what is currently when you do your gap assessment once a year, sustainability data to you know, frequently it should be available um, monthly like financial information should, ideally should be, but that's going to take time. Um, so it's so it's building capability across organisations and leveraging um, it widely. So it's not, it's finance domain plus sustainability folks working together to address this. It's not finance, but because it's coming out of ISSB, it doesn't mean suddenly finance needs to do it all. It's actually working together um, and, and leverage the skills across organisations. I think what I'd add to that is that what, one of the things we've seen in um, previous reporting efforts, and I'm thinking primarily TCFD here, is that when the standard was first described, um, there was this sort of um, dual response. You know, half of the audience went, half, but, you know, half of the audience went, hooray, a standard, fantastic frameworks, you know, great, let's go. And the other half of the audience went, oh, I could fire a cannon through this. Like, how am I going to get anything that is comparable I can make decisions on at the same level of as, as I do with um, the type of stuff I'm accustomed to with financial reporting. Um, and what actually happened was that the initial set of standards that were laid out were actually broader. We, we sat within them, we developed best practice, and then the standard itself, TCFD, has been sharpening over time. And I anticipate you probably see a similar process with sustainability reporting more broadly in ISSB. I was surprised when I first made my way through the exposure drafts 
um, particularly given some of the conversations that had been had leading into them about all of the problems they would solve and how much clarity ISSB would bring to the system, that they were as broad as they are, um, but very much appreciate why they're as broad as they are and the fact that they're still extremely useful. And I think what I would expect um, is that over time, particularly on given themes, our understanding of what best practice is and which metrics are really, really the ones that we want to see will sharpen and that the standards might also sharpen. And we've probably, I would, th I would have thought, I know this is probably exhausting to everyone on the call, but I reckon we've probably got 15 years worth of standards tightening on sustainability to go to Paul's earlier point. It took us quite a while to get financial accounting standards and reporting standards locked and at the level where we sort of were only arguing about the bits around the edges rather than all the territory in between. I think we've probably still got a bit of time to go on sustainability reporting standards and we probably will get to that level of rigor, but I, we're a decade away and a, a decade of um, lots of work, which means that we'll all um, remain employed for the duration, hopefully, unless our jobs all get automated. Thanks, Zoe. I, I might jump now to um, Amanda. I think you had your hand up first. Did you want to come off mute and ask a question? Thanks, Karen. Thanks, everyone, for a great, great discussion. I was just jumping in there just off the back of that sort of rigor question. And I guess just one of those things that's sort of happening in parallel, which a lot of you would probably know about, is that is the sort of um, monetizing of impact. So I work closely with George Serafine at, at HBS in Harvard around the impact weighted accounts framework, another framework. But what, what it's trying to do is, is how do you actually put that rigor and eventually imagine getting that into the financial accounts with the same amount of rigor. So when we compare company A with company B on, on absolutely sort of um, robust methodology, we can actually put a monetized figure against these um, uh, metrics and, and you know adds really good information for investors and for internal company decision making as well. So it's really about that sort of watch this space. It's really emerging into a sort of quite a big thing around how you how you monetize impact and and it, it's a little bit more complex in terms of trying to get that landed for the ease of a lot of companies. But what we've done is quite a lot of papers there, which you can go. I'll put a link in the chat if it's useful, um, just to keep it following on the radar on the side, not trying to confuse it. Um, but I think it's an important piece in terms of understanding, well, how are we actually going to land this separate ISSB, TCFD, FRAG, all of that? How are we going to be able to really put it into the financial accounts over time? Because that's ultimately sort of the utopia. Thanks, uh, Karen. No worries. Um, and um, I don't I, I don't think, Amanda, you, you, I suppose, didn't really have a question in there. It was more of a comment, I think, around well, that impact. So great. Or do you, would you like to hear the panel's sort of thoughts on, on monetizing yes. impact? Yes. Yes, okay. I'd love to hear their thoughts on that. Excellent. Um, Zoe, you've jumped off mute straight away. Uh, it's a, uh, well, well I, I really appreciate the comment because it is, um, you know, when we talk about the broader set of issues of double materiality, we presently talk about double materiality, the second tranche of materiality in terms of these are issues that people will, around you, stakeholders will care about, but that we can't demonstrate uh, material for the bottom line at the moment. But if you sharpen that, and this is in both of the ISSB exposure drafts very usefully, but also in the TNFD, you, you're starting to talk about um, where are your dependencies and where are your impacts. Some of those are financially relevant, some of those are not. And the exercise of trying to get our impact reporting to a point where you can monetize it and equate it is an important part of trying to get a bit of rigor around the stuff that yes, sits within the ISSB universe, but also sits within that broader gray square of areas that the that the institution has got dependency on or that has a footprint in, but that aren't previous, aren't, aren't presently very visible and aren't presently very well accounted for. So it's a really important part of the getting to goal number two that I was talking about before, which is having a commercial sector which does no significant harm and which can also select the most net positive models of doing things, which is which would be a great spot to us to get for us to get to. I would um, note in all of that, and I'll have to dig into some of the, the more recent work because in the impact weighted accounts um, papers, the the problem of equating different impacts to get to monetary values, I think is very well appreciated by um, everyone involved in the exercise and also just a little bit mind bending at times. Um, we have done a lot of work in the past on the SDGs and trying to get the SDGs to a point where you could compare company footprints on SDGs and make some statement about how they were equivalent. 
is a pretty extraordinary philosophical exercise. So that's that's one thing I'd flag in that um, in that world of uh, measuring and monetizing impact, which is going to be really important to the exercise. I think is well appreciated, but also is a very long way away, in my view, from being resolved. Thanks very much, Zoe. Um, uh, Samantha, you have a question. Hi, thank you. Um, I was going actually uh, up and down the chat to see what questions were there that hadn't been answered. And I pasted one in my notes earlier. Um, and I'll just pull it up here, sorry. Uh, so um, there's a lot of overlapping disclosure requirements, TCFD, SFDR, ISSB, the new US regulations and requirements. Um, so I guess just for the purpose of my understanding, and I'm relatively new to the sector, um, is the intent to have one standard mandated and to remove the other reporting requirements to make it clear for uh, corporations and businesses um, to report data and to move from there? Is that is that the goal? Um, who wants to jump in and answer that one? Oh, well, I, I can jump in, I guess, and answer a bit of that in terms of where the intent is. Um, we've seen some of the frameworks um, or, and I guess disclosure requirements already moved within to the um, IFRS Foundation and supporting the ISSB. Um, so SASB, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, the International Integrated Reporting um, Council, and I guess Integrated Reporting more broadly, and also uh, the Climate Disclosure Standards Board. Now, they have all um, I guess being consolidated into the IFRS Foundation and, and um, all of the teams that are, I guess have the knowledge around that work are now supporting the delivery of the ISSB standards and also um, looking at that connectivity between um, financial and, and sustainability standards as well. So that's that part of it has happened. There's yes. MOUs in place with the GRI as I mentioned so there's that connection there and as we indicated that's not quite where the ISSB is starting but they're obviously making sure that they um, that there are strong connections there. Um, they have a jurisdictional working group that's dealing with some of the challenges coming out of, um, oh, sorry, some of the challenges around, I guess, global harmonisation, as we've seen New Zealand, um, the EU, um, and you mentioned the EFRAG piece, that's the EU piece, um, and the SEC um, coming out of the US. So they have a jurisdictional working group. In fact, they released just overnight, I think, some a summary of that meeting that they had in July with that jurisdictional working group. And there was strong agreement um, that they need to have um, need to be working towards a global piece that it was going to cause too much around fragmentation if everyone else went off and did their own thing and they actually mentioned in that that the ISSB has a sort of I can't remember the exact terminology but some kind of arrangement now and a sort of working um, agreement with um, the SEC and also a similar one in place with the EU um, so they are sort of got bi bilateral agreements of some form I can't remember the exact terminology um, but there, there is a there's a summary of I guess that that jurisdictional working group meeting so that's where I guess the ISSB is definitely taking a strong stance in trying to ensure that 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 there is um, that global alignment and, and that global baseline as Prue mentioned earlier it's not going to yeah. to be the same as everything but it's more about if we can have that common um, baseline um, that is still comprehensive then other uh, jurisdictions might have some extra bits on top of that. Um, so certainly that there's a lot of work in place. I think one of the challenges in this space is, is just timelines and everyone's working to a very, very fast and actually almost similar timeline. Yes, um, the eight years. Or... Um, so so we're, we're going to see the EU standards, the New Zealand standards and the ISSB standards all come out by the end of this year, um, particularly in climate space, but obviously the EU is broader um, and in the ISSB will possibly have two standards. So everything's happening very fast. In a, in a standard setting space, this is incredibly fast. Um, mm. um, so does that sort of answer a bit of your question? It, it, it does, because I mean, like, I mean, just from a practicality perspective, I, I feel like it makes sense to mandate reporting requirements that are in alignment with global agreed standards. And I'm just wondering if that happens, will there be one framework managed by government? Like, is that is that the goal for, for this community in general? Like, is that is that the goal? So it's clean and um, orderly, you know, from a corporate governance and uh, reporting perspective to make it easier on companies more generally. 
I guess if you look at it from the perspective of what we've seen with the accounting standards, Australia was one of the first countries in the world to adopt international accounting standards coming out of IFRS and mm. um, and, and, and we're strong, I guess, contributors to the creation of that global accounting standard space. I mm. guess there's a sense we might see some similarities and, and potentially hope to see some similarities here in terms of Australia having um, strong influence, but being being a sort of um, a, a, an adopter of those as global standards, given we're part of global capital markets. but. Yeah. Um, that's th those decisions, I guess, are, are a matter for um, uh, the government and the standard setters. But as I guess everyone on the panel has indicated already, we're sort of there's a yes. sense that that things should be probably mandated in that space. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank um, you. Prue, uh, you have a question. Yeah, I just want to um, make a comment because I, I sort of see a situation in time where, and I'm just referring to Australian listed companies at the moment. Um, will release, you know, IFRS slash ISSB aligned accounts within that 60-day period, you know, their annual report. Um, but that will only be um, IFRS and ISSB, maybe with some, some GRI standards there. And those accounts are for the providers of capital. They're not general purpose. And when you think about the history in Australia, we've had um, annual reports, financial reports that have got longer and longer as more um, accounting standards have, have come out. And then um, companies were allowed to have short form annual reports from a financial reporting perspective, only had the uh, balance sheet, profit and loss, and I think cash flow statement and changes of equity. And then, then it was a big narrative. And so there was a short form, and, and which I'm, I'm pretty sure is, 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 is still available. But it, this, this process, even though we're getting this baseline, doesn't negate the need to have separate communication strategies to your employees to your suppliers, to your customers and to your community. It is not, even though I see a situation where we have a general purpose sustainability report coming out within six months of, of year end, which will cover what's in the statutory report. Um, I hate to say this, but not many people read those documents. Um, and so if you, you, it is not going to be the panacea for your employee engagement. That is a totally, totally separate str in, uh, communication strategy around sustainability. You know, issues like occupational health and safety, which I think represents a, and it's not really a non-financial risk, but a, an ENS risk is really entrenched into the way Australian companies operate. But that disclosure isn't in the annual report or the sustainability report. There's separate disclosures to suppliers. There's separate disclosures to customers around occupational health and safety, and particularly to employees. So as particularly, and if you look at climate change, you don't want to be reporting to your employees about your strategy on an annual basis in a public document. So there's, we've got to, companies have got to rethink the way they communicate and to whom and which, doc, which documents are going to provide that right information to the various stakeholders. And the first one, the, the statutory annual report to providers of capital. And then you've got to have all sorts of other communication strategy to your stakeholders. And if the expectation is it's going to come out of one document, I'm, I hate to disappoint everyone, it's just not going to work that way. I think we'll make you an honorary panelist, Prue. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I agree. I mean, I think, you know, what's really important here is that we need um, some clarity, I think, for both issuers of capital and, you know, so for both investors and companies, we need some clarity about what the bottom line expectation is on um, sustainability reporting. And I think that's what we see, you know, what we're grappling with here in this discussion. But, um, you know, for your, it's not going to mean that you don't any longer produce an annual report, you know, a, a, an annual report with glossy pictures, for example. And, um, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time um, in the last uh, six or seven years working on uh, the integrated reporting framework, for example, and I have a, a really strong belief that that will continue to be relevant, you know, having that strategic reporting against the various pillars so that you are talking to a full range of stakeholders in your annual report, which is not necessarily the same as talking to, um, you know, the, the audience for your, your ISSB reporting. I would just add to that and, and reinforce those points. You know, I'll go back to Karen, the, doc, the diagram that you had at the beginning, which I know I've cited a few times, but I think it's a really useful diagram with where the ISSB and the shareholder-focused reporting sits in in that big grey box around the outside, which is 
reporting on all of the issues that don't fit into ISSB, but also reporting for a broader set of stakeholders, that doesn't go away. You know, this I, I, I know that there's a strong um, desire to move towards a single reporting standard and a single report. And, and you, know, you know, everyone feels a bit overwhelmed by all of the disclosure that they need to make to different parties. But the, the level of interest in these issues for corporates is only going to go up over time. And so the capability and the dexterity that companies have, the visibility, the capability and the dexterity they have to view these issues, govern them, and then talk about that governance to a group of stakeholders is only going to have to go up. And I don't think to Prue's point and to Louise's point that we're going to get to a point where we can say, um, even in a limited way, here's here's one standard and we'll just do the things in this standard that all of our stakeholders will be happy and know enough about what we're doing on these issues and we can sort of pare back all of the thinking we're having to do on this. I know that's not people's intention, but I think sometimes there's a desire for that end state. And as long as as long as we keep walking down the path of commercial entities having carriage and responsibility for these set of issues and capital providers having interest in them, we're we're not going to a state where there's less reporting or a lower need for reporting capability or dexterity anytime soon, in my view. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, you know, the demand, like co co companies now report sustainability reports, not because they have to, because stakeholders are demanding it and they see value in it. That won't change. This will improve um, ISSB more information in a more standardised way for a limited set of stakeholders, but those other stakeholder demands will be there to Zoe's point, to Prue's point, that will continue to evolve and increase. Um, and if you do it well, you can create additional value. Um, and, and that's the the, the, the spectrum. Um, and these things will evolve over time, but it's not going away. Um, and then the other point is integrated reporting is built into the ISSB. Um, and so it should be focused on the most significant issues in a concise way. Um, and then there may be additional information that other stakeholders want that companies will need to put out into um, relevant disclosures. So, so totally agree, Prue, but it's going to evolve, but we should be looking to, to leverage um, systems of information so that they can be um, pulled out more easily and less onerous um, so that we can address the stakeholder needs in a more timely way. Thanks very much, everyone. Now, I guess just to sort of, um, I guess, conclude in, um, I guess, one space, and I'm sort of tossing up at the moment between, I guess, two questions I've got here as to where we might go. But, um, um, and I guess one of them is thinking around, well, what do we see as the future of the, um, I guess, from, from the ISSB's perspective, I know, Zoe, you mentioned the TNFD, so we've got the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures coming along. You know, where do we see some of these sort of the next steps coming from the ISSB's perspective? And I'm going to throw my other question out and you can pick which one you want to answer, because my other question is, I guess, um, you know, we said it's going to take us a long time to bed down sustainability reporting, and, and I think it probably just goes to, to a bit of Prue's comments around, but what's, what's your vision for if we sort of roll forward a decade or so, where do we want to see corporate reporting looking like you know how do we you know because we've seen some questions come through there's operational standards there's this disclosure standards you know what's what's your vision for the future of reporting so you can either go with what's what's next in terms of key topic areas or your vision for 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 the corporate reporting space more broadly um what about if i go really quickly on both go for it <laughs> so i reckon um probably the next cab off the rank is going to be in the um modern slavery or, you know, the, the uh, human rights area would be my guess on where the next um, uh, cab off the rank will be in that regard. In terms of in 10 years, like I hope we don't have to wait 10 years to see really significant progress. I do think that this in itself, what we're talking about, represents very significant progress. And if I go back to my point earlier, 10 years ago, these discussions weren't, these issues weren't being discussed widely between companies and many stakeholders at all and so I think we it, it does it is worthwhile just pausing for a moment just to acknowledge the extraordinary level of uh, progress that's been made and in 10 years time well let's just hope it's it's all been solved and uh, we don't have to have these discussions anymore I'm gonna I'm gonna go I'm gonna do something similar and go to the end state and then come back to what I think is next from the end state uh, it, it's my view, and I um, think Louise's points are excellent, that we um, each year the amount of work we do on this and the amount of attention we have on this just goes through the roof, which I think is 
somewhat exhausting for a lot of people on the call, but nonetheless representative of the uh, incredible level of uptake and the increased level of sophistication and understanding and strategic intuition that the commercial sector has on these issues, which is fantastic. I think we're probably going, when I read this out of TNFD and ISSB and a few others and also some of the European regulations, I feel that we're probably going to a point where we would like companies to have a handle on their dependencies and impacts across a whole series of different capitals and to be competent in handling those. I think that will we'll end up in a point to Paul's, Paul's flag this a couple of times where we have information systems that report us to do this, to have this kind of visibility in a less clunky and a more real time and more um, fluent way than we presently do. I think we'll get there in 10 years time. And I think we'll have quite a few software platforms, for example, that we don't presently use that will start to become part of how we think about these issues. Um, and hopefully that gets us to a point where we can actually, to the question that came through earlier, utilise this to have a commercial sector that is more productive on all of the fronts of wellbeing that we're interested in, not just on, on um, financial outcomes. My view is that we'll probably go to um, nature next. Uh, I think, I think it might, Louise, it might be a, a bit of a vying exercise between nature and, and <laughs> human rights. <laughs> I, I, thought we both I thought we were talking about after nature. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I no, we were, I agree. I, I agree. Climate, then nature, what was next, sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's all part of the exercise to try and get a better sense of what your dependencies and impacts are and, and, and where, where you have a footprint that you're not aware of. Um, so I think it's all heading in the same direction. Paul? Yeah, no, I, I agree both. I think I'll just start, start at the end and say, ultimately, the... Um, reporting should talk about the interconnectedness of, of all these things together to the capitals, to the impact on the environment, people, um, because these all really impact their financial value and the success of an organisation. So um, they all interact, uh, interlink, um, there's ups and downs, so it's a trade-offs, but it's, it's, it's holistic. And I think that's where I would like, my vision is it's a holistic conversation around the, the inputs, the outputs, how they um, are, are uh, impacted, um, community, society, shareholders. So it's, holy, it's meant to be holistic. Um, and I think we've got a long way to go, but the fact that we're talking about these things, they're in the consideration set, they need to then be input embedded um, so that when we talk about a, a result, financial result, we've considered the whole broader perspective. Um, and so that's kind of my nirvana. Thanks very much. And, and I guess now it just leaves me to, to basically thank very much our, our speakers. Um, thank you, uh, Zoe, uh, Paul, Louise. Um, and and thanks also for all of you for joining. Um, on behalf of the UN Global Compact Network Australia, we'd just like to apologise for the issues that some of you had joining um, at the beginning. The whole session has been recorded and that will be distributed to you afterwards, so you can catch up on the, the bit that you missed. Um, and if you can complete um, the feedback survey, there's the QR code just popped up now. Um, so if you scan that, um, you'll be able to complete that feedback survey. Um, so thank you everyone um, for, for attending. Um, and um, yep, uh, look forward to engaging with you all further on this topic. Um, as I think a few people have indicated, it's certainly not going away and it's only getting um, more and more interesting. So um, thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.